Hey guys, Tyler here. Xenomorphs are the parasitic alien species and primary antagonists from the iconic film franchise uh, Alien. Besides their physical appearance, inspired by the works of Swiss surrealist artist H.R. Giger, Xenomorphs are distinguished from many other aliens in science fiction by another characteristic. They are not an intelligent civilization, but predatory creatures with no higher goal than propagation of their species and destruction of anything that poses them a threat. Other key aspects of Xenomorph's biology and social behavior lend comparisons to real Earth life, believe it or not, and their design deliberately evokes sexual imagery, both male and female. In this video, I'd like to examine the Xenomorph's biology comparing them to our expectations about aliens in real life. Let's get started. Before we go any further, I'd like to take a minute to talk to you about today's sponsor, Magic Spoon. Magic Spoon offers cereals that taste just like the flavors you loved as a kid, but without any sugar or artificial ingredients. Magic Spoon is an easy source of protein, making it convenient to eat when you're too busy or tired to cook. They've got popular flavors like fruity, cocoa, frosted, and peanut butter, and many more. Magic Spoon is keto-friendly, gluten-free, and grain-free, and is great for those who are carb-conscious. Every serving of Magic Spoon cereal has 13 to 14 grams of protein, 0 grams of sugar, and 4 to 5 grams of net carbs, so you can feel good about what you're eating. And y'all know me, I'm a night cereal guy, so cereal that's deliciously nostalgic and sugar-free perfectly fits my lifestyle. My favorite flavor has got to be the frosted. It's got a crunchy texture that I like, and the flavor pops like some of my favorite cereals from childhood. Use my code Orange River or click the link in the description to go to magicspoon.com today and get $5 off. You can also find Magic Spoon in your local grocery store. And Magic Spoon is so confident in their product that it's backed with a 100% happiness guarantee online. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. So click the link in the description to go to magicspoon.com slash orange river for $5 off. Big thanks to Magic Spoon for sponsoring today's video. Now, let's get back to it. Like wasps or termites, xenomorphs are parasocial. Uh, sorry, I mean eusocial. In such an organizational system, a single fertile queen breeds offspring that fulfill distinct labor roles, often referred to as castes. For xenomorphs, the alien queen breeds a caste of warriors. Queens are significantly larger and stronger than warriors, approximately four and a half meters or 15 feet in height. They also have two sets of arms, and their heads are protected by a large, flat crest. Pregnant alien queens possess an ovipositor on their lower torso, responsible for creating eggs, an organ also seen in many Earth insects. Naturally, eggs form the first stage of the xenomorph's life cycle. Interestingly, it was not until aliens that the egg's role in the life cycle was confirmed, having originally been unclear from the final cut of the first film. The eggs themselves are ellipsoid-shaped, leathery objects about two or three feet tall with a four-lobed opening on top. Giger initially designed the eggs to have a more obviously vaginal appearance, but the producers were concerned Catholic countries would ban the film if the illusion were too strong. So he changed the lobes to have a cross shape that, in Giger's words, people from those countries were so fond of looking at. I gotta say, that's some next level trolling right there. As a potential host approaches an egg, its lobes unfold like flower petals, and the second stage of the xenomorph life cycle erupts from inside, the face hugger. When alien screenwriter Dan O'Bannon originally conceived the basic premise for that movie, a mining ship sent to investigate a mysterious message on an alien planetoid, he initially could not think of an interesting way to get the alien on the ship. After waking up from a dream, co-writer Ronald Shusett envisioned what became the second and third stages of the Xenomorph's life cycle. The face hugger, which impregnates its victims with an embryo called a chest burster. Face huggers have eight long, finger-like appendages that allow them to crawl very fast, unlike Metroids, giving them an appearance similar to horseshoe crabs. Unlike horseshoe crabs, which, in my estimation, 
men have never really hurt anyone, face huggers were designed to evoke the symbolism of homosexual oral rape. Oh god, I can't say that on YouTube, can I? When making contact with a host's mouth, it grips its legs around the victim's head and wraps its tail around the host's neck. The face hugger then tightens its tail to render the host unconscious by depriving it of oxygen and inserting a proboscis down the host's throat, thus implanting the embryo. Attempts to remove face huggers usually prove fatal, as, like a boa constrictor, it will only tighten its grip and its acidic blood will prevent it from being safely cut away. By the way, speaking of that acidic blood, let's take a detour for a minute. Alien's blood is extremely potent and capable of corroding nearly any substance on contact with alarming speed. It has a dull yellowish green color and is seemingly pressurized inside the body so that when punctured it spurts out. Shusit has suggested that the purpose of the acidic blood was to make the creature unkillable, and if traditional firearms or explosives were used to attack it, the acidic blood would eat through the hull of the ship. The novelization of Alien suggests that the acid may not actually be blood itself, but a different kind of fluid maintained under pressure between two layers of skin. Indeed, I've talked on this channel before about aliens that lack proper blood, including the Breen from Star Trek, and compared their white secretion to the hemolymph found in, again, many insects. But Xenomorph's blood is definitely not hemolymph. It's most certainly acid, and behind the scenes, it's been theorized it could be hydrogen sulfide, characterized by the foul smell of rotten eggs. Hydrogen sulfide is, of course, toxic to humans and, when ingested, rapidly damages organs and can cause breathing difficulties to convulsions, even death. Xenomorphs would be immune to these effects thanks to an internal coating similar in function to the human stomach's ability to protect itself against its own digestive fluids. Xenomorphs are even shown to be conscious of their acidic blood's effects, including using it to their advantage and serving as yet another example of observational learning and problem solving. Their body heat also matches the ambient temperature of their environment, making them indistinguishable from their surroundings via thermal imaging. Back to their life cycle though, after implantation, a facehugger dies. The embryo's host wakes up and initially shows no sign of negative symptoms, but symptoms build acutely after the facehugger detaches, including sore throat, nausea, congestion, and hunger. Through a process called horizontal gene transfer, a real phenomenon in which DNA moves between organisms rather than from parent to offspring, the embryo takes on many traits of the host such as bipedalism, quadrupedalism, or other structural attributes. Over the course of a number of hours, the embryo develops into the chest burster, at which point it emerges in a process that is rather self-explanatory. And, uh, oh yeah, this process absolutely kills the host. When it erupts, the chest burster is less than 30 centimeters or one foot tall. It soon undergoes a dramatic growth spurt and reaches adult size in a matter of hours and even molts before reaching maturity. The latter trait, another familiar part of many insects and reptiles' life cycles. In its adult form, the xenomorph is about two meters or 6.6 .6 feet in height and possesses great physical strength. They have segmented, blade-tipped tails. All stages of the xenomorph life cycle lack external eyes, suggesting they navigate their environment through some alternative method. In the novelization of Alien, Ash posits that xenomorphs see via electrical impulse, similar to the lateral line organs of fish that allow them to detect movement, vibration, and pressure gradients in surrounding water. Adults also notably have a second set of jaws powerful enough to smash through bone or metal. They are located at the end of a phallic-shaped tongue, which can extend rapidly and be used as a weapon. They can produce a strong, thick resin excreted from their jaws, used to build hives and cocoon victims, and even use the walls of their hives as camouflage. Much like a spitting cobra, they also use it to blind and immobilize their victims. Throughout the films, xenomorphs are shown with a fluctuating number of fingers, and they're alternatively portrayed as being plantigrade or digitigrade, typically in accordance with their host. Ah, damn it, Tyler, don't make another joke about... 
I've talked numerous times about digitigrade and plantigrade statures, such as in my video about the Aquarians from Mass Effect, and this has led to some speculation that I'm actually a furry. Besides very distinct examples of xenomorphs being shown operating machinery, once again, they're not really intelligent in the same sense as you and I. Well, actually, uh, I don't know you. you. You may be bright, I'm not sure. Corporate needs you to stop insulting your audience. Anyway, even though, like we've discussed, they possess many of the same eusocial characteristics of insect colonies, which are often said to constitute swarm intelligence, Individual xenomorphs are not depicted as being the same kind of sapient, self-aware, philosophical life form typical of most other science fiction species. They don't have a culture, so to speak, and they've demonstrated little actual emotion save for basic instincts of self-preservation all life forms have, as well as maternal protection of their eggs. They also lack a language, making few vocalizations besides snarls and high-pitched shrieks when attacking or in pain. They regularly hit Kiss, but are mostly silent when stalking prey. So the question is, could an alien species like this truly become spacefaring? Well, given how they do get onto the ship in Alien, clearly, yes. They're parasites. It's what they do. By the way, guys, did you know that there are more species of parasitic wasp than any other animal on Earth? That's a fact that kind of keeps me up at night. Oh, you're so right, Pim. I forgot about that factoid. It stands to reason that, given the preponderance of animal species on our planet are literal parasites, parasitic aliens could be the norm in our galaxy, and thus the universe at large. That's certainly an ethos carried by the likes of Metroid, which of course was heavily inspired by aliens. On the other hand, many researchers in the field of astrobiology believe that the majority of spacefaring alien species may be benevolent, or at the very least, lawful neutral. This is because they would need to cooperate on a large scale to amass enough energy to power interstellar travel while avoiding the pitfalls that would lead to their own annihilation. But these are intelligent civilizations, whereas the xenomorphs are, it, it, you get it. As we venture out into the stars, we need to make sure that we have respect for any life that we might come across, including respect for its potential dangers. With that, thank you all so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a thumbs up down below and don't forget to share it. That stuff really helps me out. If you haven't subscribed yet, be sure to do that as well so you won't miss future uploads and click the bell icon to receive all notifications. If you want to support my work even further, you can become a patron at patreon.com slash orange river, link in the description, or become a YouTube member by clicking the join button on my channel page. I just want to give a quick shout out to all my donors who allow me to bring on outside talent like editors to make more high quality content for you to enjoy. By becoming a patron or member, you also get access to awesome perks like behind the scenes photos and videos, patron and member only polls, name of the credits, merch discounts, and more. Or you can drop a one-time super thanks or PayPal donation. All are appreciated. Links to my PayPal as well as my social media and merch store are in the description too. That's all I have for this week. Is that the, is that the fucking cat scratch? Get away from her, you bitch!